uh, to everyone that's listening, welcome to this um, to this short interview where I'm going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Stephen Backhouse. I came across Dr. Stephen Backhouse when he came to speak at the Love Dudley Theology Network. Well, I think we had about 70 odd people there. And uh, we had a fascinating evening together. It was great to listen to him. And um, one of the things that Stephen talked about that he will talk about on this interview, and we'll do that in a moment but after he introduces himself, what was this whole idea of principalities and powers, things. Uh, I think he called them faceless powers that control and influence us. Mm. I think given the moment that we're in, this COVID crisis moment, it'd be really useful for him to share a little bit about principalities and powers. We're also going to talk a little bit about conspiracy theories and uh, just a bit of a perspective on con con conspiracy theories. And then the apocalyptic language um, that uh, the Bible uses and could this be in any way uh, attached to this present moment in time. So, Stephen, great to have you with us. Yeah. Um, maybe you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I last was with you when I was doing this thing called Tent Theology. That's when yeah. I was with the, with the, uh, was it Love Black Country or was it Love Dudley that I Love was Love Dudley. With? It was Love Dudley I was with. But so, Tent Theology is what I do. I used to be a an academic theologian. So I used to work for um, a, a large Anglican training college in London called St. Melitis College. And more recently, I used to work for Westminster Theological Centre. So these are two charismatic theology colleges, which are mainly training people for the ministry or are preparing people for some kind of professional Christian life. So they're already full-time Christian workers, and they, they are told by somebody somewhere they have to study theology. And I enjoyed theology, but I got a little bit tired of that idea that theology was just for people training for full-time Christian ministry to become professional Christians. So one of the things, one of the things I did about this is I quit my jobs, and I went freelance with this thing called tent theology, which is I bring theological, I open up spaces for theology inside local churches or local networks. And I try and help normal Christians who aren't full-time professional Christians. They're not full-time academics. They're not training to be pastors or vicars or priests. And uh, the idea is that we could open up space. We can talk with intellectual seriousness about our Christianity we can not give up meeting together. We can do it in a context of worship. We can listen to the Holy Spirit for each other. We can practice you know, healing and worship and words of knowledge. And we can do all these things for each other and do them with theology. And we don't have to quit our jobs and go to a, some place called a seminary or a Bible college to do it. And so this is part of my, my scheme, really. This is my venture. I did it. I started about three years ago, two and a half years ago, and it's, it's really fun. So I called it tent theology on purpose because the idea is that it's temporary and it's easy to set up. It's easy to take down. It's easy to take anywhere and churches will invite me in and, and I'll help them open up spaces for thinking theologically about whatever it is they want to go through. Um, and without them having to feel that they need to start a whole institution and hire an academic admin team and all that stuff. And we're not worrying about essays or accreditation or anything. It's just, I come in, I live with the church for three, four days a week, um, go away again, come back again later on, and stay in touch during the time. And I also bring in other people. So I have a lot of friends who also are maybe trained theologically, but also feel that they want some of the stuff that they care about to be yeah. a wider audience who wouldn't normally access theology. So often if I'm asked to come in to do tent theology with somebody, it's not just me talking. I'll, I'll bring in other people to help me. Who That's them great. Yeah. It's just a way of perhaps getting things in circulation. You know, churches, churches that don't have any access to the wider, deeper Christian thought, you know, 2000 years worth of Christian thinking and, and practice. Churches that don't have any access to that, they go crazy. They go a bit weird. And likewise, academic theology departments that have no contact with the local church, they just get horrible and dry and pointless. And you need both. You need everybody to be in circulation with each other, you know. Fantastic. That's partly what I try and do. 
brilliant. And I think um, if anybody searches Tent Theology or Dr. Stephen Backhouse, I think you'll very quickly get onto your website, no, won't you? So <laughs> if, um, if you're a local church or a local church leader and want to access uh, those great resources, then you know, by all means go online and, um, and I'm sure you'll find those. Uh, we will probably post uh, Stephen's details um, uh, in terms of Tent Theology uh, and its location on the website at some point, so you'll be able to access it that way as well. So. Uh, Stephen, we were talking when we were together, um, I can't remember what it was now, but when you came to speak at the Love Dudley Theology Network, yeah. by this whole idea of principalities and powers. And yeah. um, I think you had us all, all really entranced uh, during that session, thinking about principalities and powers in a slightly different way to maybe the traditional, certainly from my yeah. background, evangelical charismatic upbringing. Yeah. Um, where primarily principalities and powers maybe were attached to uh, sort of thinking about geographical locations. You, you said that was still true, yeah, but right. helped us to see how they might be at work in culture maybe, or around us, um, not just sort of over a geographical space. I wonder, given the situation that we're in currently, you could, you could sort of tell us a little bit more about how you see principalities and powers out working in this current COVID crisis? Well, um, I mean, there's two things to mention. The first thing is that I also am a charismatic Christian from an evangelical roots, right? So I'm not, I'm not speaking into or out of, I mean, I'm not speaking against that culture. This is my, this is my sure. culture as well. Um, so that, that, it's not a taking away it's more of an addition too so it's so when i when i'm speaking to people who are drinking from charismatic pentecostal wells i'm saying i'm not trying to take anything away i'm trying to expand or add to the riches of the language that you're already using so this is part of my approach the other thing to say is i'm a political theologian by training and practice and what that means is not um you know what party should you vote for every five years it's more how have christians what is our theology of power how have christians imagined what they're doing with their power when they organize themselves when they agree with each other what are they doing with themselves what they think their vision for the world is how do they relate to other groups that have a different vision for power what do christians think they should do with the power once they have it so that when you start to deal with those questions you're, you're dealing with i guess we call it small p politics right yeah. how to organize ourselves, how to use the, the collective power that we have. So that's political theology. And when you do that, you realize that's a lot of the New Testament is political. Anytime you get language about, you know, everyone submit one to another, or when Jesus says, don't, lord your, don't be like the Gentiles who lord their power over others, or when he says you should lay down your life for your friends, take up your cross. I mean, the cross was a political instrument of Roman torture. You know, um, Jesus was a king and he had a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And you realize, oh yeah, the, how we use our power and what we think it means to be powerful is not peripheral to the New Testament. It's pretty much the heart and soul of it. It's pretty much, you cannot talk about the gospels without talking about politics. And so part of the language that the New Testament uses to describe organized power is powers and principalities. I mean, it's there even in the title, powers, right? And what I often say, charismatics have like, we've got one arm that we've really flexed really well. We've built up the muscles and that's the muscle of powers and principalities is all about demons. And so we're really strong on demons and we think of it in terms of spiritual warfare. So we think, ah, oh, yeah, Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And there Paul is talking about demons. He's talking about evil spirits. And so we're like, yes, we're ready to do our spiritual warfare. But what we're perhaps less good at is flexing the other arm, which is that Powers and principalities is more than just demons. It is sometimes demons. So I'm not saying it's not. But in the New Testament, in fact, more times, 
more often when the New Testament language uses powers and principalities language, it's actually talking about institutions and human constructs and habits and forms of life that we have submitted ourselves to. And so there's another muscle that I want Christians to start to exercise, which is that powers and principalities essentially means faceless powers which influence our lives. And sometimes, if you think about it, like, um, oh, well, a good example would be in Ephesians 6, Paul says, struggle is against rulers and authorities, powers and principalities. And he's talking about demons. All right. In Romans 13, Paul says, I want everyone to submit to the ruling authorities. And he's talking about Caesar and administration. But he's using the same language in Ephesians 6 for demons that he now uses for government and bureaucracy in Romans 13, right? We need to start understanding that he's, that the New Testament has a vision for faceless powers which influence our lives. And sometimes they're demons and sometimes they're government. Sometimes it's money. Money is a faceless power which influences our life. In Romans 8, Paul rattles off a whole list of things that neither height nor depth, neither things present or things to come, neither angels nor demons, rulers or powers, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ, right? And then, so that means in, in, in one breath, Paul has included things like gravity, geography, time, rulers, powers, angels, demons. In his imagination, all those things are, they all belong under one kind of umbrella term. And all those things are faceless forces, which we can either come under or we could be on top of. So we could either serve them and be controlled by them, or we could put them in their place. And this is what you get when you get all those hymns. If you read pretty much any letter that Paul writes, and not just Paul, it happens in Hebrews as well. There's always a little passage, isn't there, where all the powers and principalities are put at Jesus' feet. Everything is put under his feet. And he's the ruler over all powers and principalities. And the, the Christian imagination was, we're going to put these powers back in their place, back in their rightful place. And it's not that they're all evil and must all be destroyed. It's more that they, the principalities are, have taken, they've often taken more than they're owed, or we've, we're giving them more than they deserve, more power. And we need to put them, remind them who they really serve or remind them what their, power, what their purpose is, right? So it's not one of, the, the approach, the New Testament approach to these things is not one of like, utter warfare it's more one of witness to the power so in in you know paul says the church bears witness in ephesians he says the church bears witness to the powers the mysteries of god are revealed to the powers and principalities and the church makes man makes manifold witness to these things in colossians 2 he says that the powers and principalities were exposed to open shame at the cross. Um, and the idea is that, there are, that what, what is kept secret or what is sort of been left hidden becomes made plain. And that seems to be the role of the Christians towards principalities and powers. Um, you know, an example would be where in, in Mark and in other gospels where the disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus comes and he's, and the Pharisees are, are angry and they, they're mad at the disciples. And Jesus, his response is, but Sabbath was made for humans. Humans weren't made for Sabbath. That um, the principality of the Sabbath, which was a human invention, you know, the, a, a practice, an inherited tradition, a religious practice, a form of life, is, has a purpose. He doesn't say the Sabbath is evil and must be destroyed. He says Sabbath was made for humans and it's got a purpose and a place. And if we sacrifice our people to the Sabbath, if, we, if we're serving the Sabbath, 
if we're giving it more power than it should have, then we made a God out of it, right? And so Jesus' response is to put the Sabbath back in its place. And you see what also happens then in the rest of the New Testament is similar actions where the powers and principalities are the, um, in Colossians, again, Paul describes basic human, um, he describes things like religious festivals or basic human common sense. Um, he calls them elemental principles of this world. And he's not, and he's not talking about um, occult philosophy or practice here. When he says the basic principles of this world, he's talking about forms of life that you're born into that you just follow as a matter of course. And he says, don't be held captive by these things. Basic human traditions. Don't, don't serve them and worship them. Don't act as if your basic human traditions are gods, because they're not. We invented them. They have a purpose, they have a place, and their place is to serve Jesus, to be at his feet. So if you were to um, give us an example, maybe a brief example of, of how that might apply to the current right. situation. Give right. us an example, Stephen, of how it might apply. Yeah, so, okay, so I think, I feel like a, a good example of a, it's worth pointing out that principalities are not always all bad. That's not, the, this isn't the question about them. They're not all bad. An angel is a principality, right? As well. Yeah. What, what they are is what's bad about them is when they do more than they, than they should, or when they take, they, they burst their bounds, they, you know, they get too big for their britches. That's what's bad about them. So a, a demon is, a, is an angel that is proud and doesn't want to do what he's been designed to do. So an angel, a demon is an angel who's rebelled. He's burst his bounds. Um, and so you can think about like in practical speaking, let's think about our church practice today, right now in lockdown. Uh, you know, I've been noticing that the sort of charismatic evangelical world I've been a part of has quite, quite naturally has, uh, bought into the idea of let's think about music for example how important live music is to our worship so we you know we have churches in which to be on um, to be on the worship team we call it a worship team and to be on the worship team you have to audition and not just anybody can pick up an instrument and play it's only the people who are really good at it okay and we might even have a church in which we pay people to play music for us, or at least some of the people. And so we've, we've professionalized our music. And then we've called it worship. Okay. From my New Testament knowledge, I would say we've created a principality now. The worship team and the, the form of life, the habit of life that we've just naturally assumed is the way you do things. You come into a church and you ask them, why do you have... A professional team to play music for you and you look at them and you go well that's just what we do here that's what we do because and then you realize oh okay so that's your principality you've you've created a form of life which has now become just an, an assumption or, uh, this is what we do and now what happens when that principality is you can't do it anymore <laughs> so now i live in a culture in which um I can't go into a room with a really good sound system and a smoke machine and a lights. I can't have attractive people in skinny jeans playing music for me, right? My worship, which, which that was like a form of life which has become so identified with worship that in a way it's become almost impossible to imagine how worship could not be that. And now I have to live in a world in which I don't have access to that. And for example, I'm part of a, my home group, my church home group now has to meet on Zoom. And the leader of, the, of, of my home group, she wants to help us worship in singing. So what she does is she gets on her piano, which is quite far away from the from the from her laptop so the sound isn't very good 
we all have to mute our computers because Zoom doesn't allow us to sing together very well. And she, you know, has to sing in very less than ideal. She's, uh, in case she ever sees this, I do want her to know she's a really good singer. <laughs> but, you know, the conditions are not worship music in a charismatic environment. The conditions are somebody in a far away is playing a piano and singing all by herself a song and we are all having to sing along with her and it's almost as far away from the, your typical charismatic culture as you can imagine and it's beautiful it's really good and the reason it's good is in a way that principality of that form of life that habit that we've all got locked into has been exposed it's right. no we can't do it. We can't come under it. And we're forced to, we're forced to, in a sense, put that in its place and say, okay, professionalized music culture, you have taken over the world of worship for too long. We're going to put you back in your place and we're going to build something new. You know, you're no longer serving your purpose. You're not fit for purpose anymore. You're literally not fit for purpose. We can't do it. You're not helping us anymore. So we need to build something else. And so what we're building is something like everybody in their own rooms is bringing their little loaves and fishes and they're offering their worship, their sung worship to God in, in, I don't know, in honesty and humility with probably hardly any excellence. So my friend who's playing piano in her house, she's singing really beautifully. I can guarantee you I'm not singing beautifully when, when I mute. But it's my worship, right? And I just feel, I feel like that's an example and it, of, of something that we perhaps as a culture have allowed that form of music and singing to, to dominate our imaginations or to take over. And right, now yeah. it's put in its place. That's an example. And you notice that I'm not saying music teams are evil. I'm not saying they're demonic, but I am saying, I think in my church culture, professional music teams have probably taken more than they're owed. And all, all that's happening now is they're being put back in their place. Understand. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. One of the other things you talked about um, in our conversation earlier before we, before we started recording was, was um, the apocalyptic language of the Bible. Yeah. And, um, how, how that might have some application. We often use that language attached to sort of, I guess, again, in my tradition, final end. Yes. But you've got, you've got some really in, sort of interesting uh, insight into, into this being language that might be useful to frame our current situation uh, and, face as well. It, this is related to powers and principalities, actually. Because once you realize that powers and principalities are not just spiritual beings they are also any faceless power which influences our life is a principality well part of the story of the new testament is putting those faceless putting a face to the faceless putting a name to the nameless where things have grown too big or lost their way then we tell we remind them who they're for and what they're doing i mean paul does that in romans 13 he reminds caesar who he's there for for example so what you're doing is whenever you tell a, principal, a principality which has grown so big or assumes that it is now God, it assumes it doesn't have a beginning and it's not going to have an end, right? And it demands human sacrifice. That's what principalities do. In one way or another, we're going to sacrifice to our gods. And what happens when you tell a god or a form of life that it isn't God anymore and that you're not going to sacrifice your life to it? In a way, that principality has come to an end it's the end of the world for that principality for that form of life and the new testament uses the language of apocalypse to describe not the end of all existence apocalypse doesn't mean the end of everything it means the end of an era and the beginning of a new one it's the end of an age and the beginning of a new age so for example jesus will talk about the, the the kingdoms, I mean, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is here, which is just another way of saying where God's reign is unopposed. So the kingdom of heaven is like, 
it's not a place you go to when you die. It's a, it's a way of describing what happens when people say yes to God or where God's reign is unopposed. That's the kingdom of heaven. And if the kingdom of heaven is here, that means the kingdoms of man are in danger or they're fading or they're gone, right? And so it's the, the end of one age and the beginning of a new one. And the language the New Testament uses for that is apocalypse, which doesn't mean the end of all like life on earth. It means the end of one era and the beginning of a new. So apocalyptic language is always, it always has that going on in the New Testament. It's always, it's always like the cracks in the old order are showing and something new is coming out. So don't be scared. So if you look at Mark 13, where Jesus famously gets very apocalyptic in Mark 13, you look at the book of Revelation, which is an apocalyptic literature. The language, uh, Paul does it. If you look at Romans as well, he gets apocalyptic. It, the language is always connected to, for example, women giving child, giving labor, or women in childbirth. And the idea is that always, for that woman, it's the end of her world. Her one era of her life is coming to an end, but a new one is beginning, right? And Jesus is always talking about birth pangs and all creation waits in, Paul says all creation waits in eager expectation, groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. And the idea is that always the end of one thing is coming and there's going to be, it's like, it's like birth pains. It's not the end of everything. It's the beginning of something new. And so Jesus and the New Testament ends up saying, essentially, don't lose your minds. Don't go crazy. This is just the end of one thing and the beginning of a new. This is the powers and principalities are losing their grip. And you're going to get wars and rumors of wars. You always will have wars and rumors of wars. You'll always have these things. Um, don't lose your minds. Don't get swept up in these things because the, the new age is here. The new age is coming. We're building something new. And in a way, you're, it's always happening. So apocalypse is always happening. Every generation dies. Every generation has its own apocalypse. And every generation has a new one coming through. And the focus is not sort of um, do whatever it takes to preserve the current state of events, the current age, the current generation at all costs. That's when you get principalities who lock down and become demonic or become evil. When the principality refuses to die, <laughs> refuses to end, refuses to make way for the new one, right? That's where you get become demonic that's where principalities start to demand human sacrifice as it were that that one generation or one era demands that everything constantly feeds into it so it will so it will persist through time and you get institutions that just refuse to change or refuse to dismantle themselves refuse to give over anything to anybody else because they're just trying to stay alive they're trying to lurch forward through into history and so much of the New Testament is, is kind of the opposite. It's like, consider others better than yourself. Submit one to another. Um, in Philippians 2, Jesus doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead he empties himself or he self-empties. And the word is kenosis in Philippians 2. And kenosis doesn't mean like become a cringing worm. What it means is... Um, withdraw your will to make space for other people's will so when you self empty you are putting a limit on your own self so that your ego doesn't flow to fill the space right and so um the vision in philippians 2 is a a, a powerful person like jesus who was so aware of his own power that rather than dominate the space he was in he put a limit to his own will to make space for other people's wills, which is what becoming like a servant means. It doesn't mean becoming servile and, and cringing. It means a servant exists for the sake of another person's will. And there's an example there of like um, uh, how to approach. If, if, you think the, if you think your institutions that you've built 
must persist through all time and no, nobody else should ever get what they want or get their way. You're not practicing kenosis. Paul said everyone should have their mind like Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to describe kenosis. And it's like, well, how do we build our institutions that we get to withdraw our will or set a limit on what it wants in order to make space for other ones? How does a generation put a limit on its will to make space for the next one coming through, right? And that's where like apocalypse is actually a hopeful thing because you can say, look, the end of one era does not mean the end of the world. It just means the end of an age. And there's always a new age coming through. And our job, I think, as followers of Christ is to, is to look at, well, how do we help the new age flourish and grow? How do we do that? You know, that's what everyone lay down your life for your friends looks like. That's what that is, you know? It's where, right. you, where you consider others better than yourself or where you, you don't lord your power over others. You don't dominate others. You always seek ways to give it away or to, to help others to flourish. So apocalypse for me doesn't mean like uh, the zombie apocalypse or the lightning bolts coming out of the sky and everything in flames. It just means, hey, the current way we have living, the current institutions we've got, our current addiction to, I don't know, money or instantaneous self gratification or, you know, those things are being challenged right now. It's an apocalypse. What new thing is coming instead? Fascinating. Yeah. yeah really fascinating. Um, one of the other things we've, we've talked about is this, in this moment in time, everybody's looking for a way to try and make sense, I suppose, yeah, in right. situation. So this whole sense-making process that we're all going through. And, uh, it, and so there, mm. there are lots of conspiracy theories out there about um, yeah. stuff that's being done to us yeah um, by a secret elite in some shape or form just yeah. just just give us a perspective on on our our penchant for conspiracy theory i mean i you do have to if you're a student of history like i am so i, I had to write a couple i've written a couple of church history books for example and one of the things you have to point out is that people have at times of uh of mass crisis People have always blamed a secretive group for that crisis. And it, do you know what? It used to be the Christians. <laughs> so when, so when, and, 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 and by the way, you know, okay, so there's these conspiracy theories of like, oh, coronavirus is caused by a secret group who are, you know, sacrificing children and drinking their blood. I've, I've heard this, you know, Bill Gates is sacrificing children, drinking their blood. He's part of a secret group. He started, you know, fi uh, coronavirus in order to cover over the 5G and, and all this stuff. Like, all these kind of conspiracy theories, which is always a secretive person, a new technology, and control of the world. The, those three things always happen, okay? And today, it's people like Bill Gates, and it's 5G, and it's coronavirus. But do you know what? During the Reformation, it was the Jews who are using the printing press to control the world. Or it was the Pope who's drinking the blood of babies in order to control the world. Um, during the plagues in Rome in the 200s, you know, in the, in the first and second centuries of the, of the Roman Empire, it was the Christians who in their secret societies were drinking the blood of babies and are now controlling the world. It's always kind of like a secret group, which is doing something imaginatively horrible in order to con secretly control the world. And I don't need, but the, when I look at the, when I look at the, the world, I was like, I don't need a conspiracy theory to describe the evil that's going on. My vision, and the New Testament doesn't go to conspiracy theories. In fact, it's explicitly will tell you not to get worried about that stuff. Instead, it's pay attention that men do evil, men love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. Um, people are motivated by fear. So governments always use 
times of crisis in order to get more power for themselves. That's what power does. Institutions always act out of fear to try and lock down and grab as much power as they can. They always have done that. Humans always give, in times of, uh, when they're scared, they always give their power to a strong man that they think is gonna help them. I don't need like a secret sort of conspiracy of the Jewish plot to control the world or the uh, billionaires who are sort of rubbing their hands and deliberately doing this stuff. I don't need that to describe just the basic movement of a principality and a power, which is humans invent institutions, which they then sacrifice to in order to keep those institutions going because they're scared of death. They create a thing which they hope is going to outlive them and outlast them. And they pour all their resources into that thing and they give that thing their lives and their freedom um, because they're trying to create something that is going to outlast them. And it always happens. And those things are always taking more than they're owed. Um, and so what I kind of think of when I think of like conspiracy theories and stuff, it's like, it's like an extra, it's an extra addition that I don't need to describe what's going on in the world. And if anything, the conspiracy theories are worse because they're hiding or they're claiming that something's going on when the real thing is right in plain sight. Like children are being, you know, we are absolutely ruining our children's lives through our addiction to media, like the forms of media that we have, the social media, for example. Like, you know, think of the way that our social media is obsessed with um, appearance and instant access to people's lives. So like our children are, are having absolute lies poured into them by each other, right? You don't have to explain a secret cabal of pedophiles to explain the way that we are ruining our children's lives, sacrificing our children to social media right now. We're allowing them to just lie to each other and, and speak poison into each other's lives and to to bully themselves, you know. We've created this thing. It's now controlling the narrative. And I look at that and I think, well, I don't need to, I don't need to say that's Bill Gates who secretly has invented social media in order to be a pedophile or whatever. I just wanna say, no, we've created this thing which we've now given control over to and that it's hurting our children. And that's just one example, you know. But, uh, you know, and you can see this with, with the other things that we do. We, we hurt each other. Um, think of our addiction to oil. You know, we're just absolutely, it's, it's harder to imagine a world, it's e easier to imagine the world coming to an end than it is to imagine a world without petrochemicals or capitalism. You know, it's easier to imagine a world absolutely ceasing to exist than it is to imagine a world without capitalism. But we invented capitalism and now we're sacrificing our humans to it, right? And, and all, uh, when I look at that, I don't need to say, oh, that's a secret group of Jews who invented capitalism in order to control the world. All I need to say is, oh yeah, we humans have collectively created a, a, a form of life and a system and a set of habits which served a purpose and had a good reason for existing, but it's grown too big. And it's demanding humans now to keep feeding it, to keep it going. And it's dominated our collective imaginations to such a degree, we can't even really imagine a world without it. And I, you don't need a conspiracy theory to just say, oh yeah, we have, we have given this thing too much power. We've, and now we're scared. And so out of fear, we've given some of these governments and or systems and forms of life too much power because we're scared. And all I want to do is, Jesus said, you know, do not fear. Do not be anxious about anything. And those are the kind of responses I feel like, rather than try and run around and fearfully imagine that there's a group trying to control us. It's the fear itself that we need to think, oh, what is our fear making us do? I don't know. This is all very, not very clear. <laughs> Stephen, I feel like the problems are there's real problems in plain sight, 
that you don't need conspiracy theories to describe and explain. And we've always had conspiracy theories and they're part of the problem. They're part of the, uh, the misinformation campaign that principalities use to hide what they're doing. Uh, an additional resource that you may find useful um, is that uh, Stephen's put together um, a Bible study uh, uh, looking at the whole of the book of Mark and is about to embark on a Bible study looking at the book of Acts. And so I just thought I'd give uh, Stephen a couple of moments to explain what he's doing and why he's doing it and maybe a little bit about how you can access that and then we'll attempt, we'll uh, make sure that we uh, post links on the site so that you can access that course. Yeah, so what I've done is, if you go to my website, thetenttheology.com, the media page, there is a whole list of uh, Bible studies that I've been putting together. I call it the Bible study at the beginning of the world, which is an apocalyptic language. And I'm doing a political theology Bible study where I were going through, in one instance, the Gospel of Mark, chapter by chapter, sometimes line by line. The entire gospel is covered, reading it as or through the lens of political theology. Each episode is half an hour long, and they're all free to download. And I'm asking people to pay what they can. And all that money from the Gospel of Mark studies is going to a fund I've set up for people in need during isolation, people who can't work during isolation. So that was the Bible study on the Gospel of Mark, which has now ended it's still available to download but i'm beginning one on the gospel in the acts the acts of the apostles and we're going to do it again so we're going to go chapter by chapter through the book of acts and again looking at the apocalyptic political sort of language and the lens of politics and apocalypse through the book of acts as well and i invite anybody who wants that resource to go to tenttheology.com media page and they will find it. I know that some churches are using these studies as a group exercise. So home groups are using these things or individuals are using them as part of their quiet time. But, you know, there's enough there. You can do a month of Mark or a month of Acts. And it's a, a way to start to bring out some information or some generate some material that could be of some use to people and also will help to raise some money for people in need along the way. Stephen, thanks very much. It's been really uh, useful to spend some time talking to you. We trust those of, us that are, those of you that are watching this um, interview will have found uh, some of this stuff really interesting. Do post questions um, on the Facebook page or contact us at Love Black Country if you want to explore some of these issues a little bit further. Um, thanks very much for listening. We really appreciate your time taking some time out to listen to this. What we're trying to do is provide a, a backdrop of information and, uh, and, and sight as to uh, this moment in time that we live in, this uh, moment of, of crisis, which is global in size. So um, trust that you have enjoyed this interview and, um, and look forward to posting more videos in the future um, uh, from a variety of different sources. Thanks very much.